Sage Dammers is the co-founder and CEO of Addictive Addictive Wellness. He's a master chocolatier. He's dedicated his life to the pursuit of holistic wellness and nutrition. Welcome to the show, Sage. Thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Yeah, excited to have you on. Tell us a little about your personal life, more about your work, and why you do what you do. I grew up kind of in and around the, the health world. I had the great blessing to have parents that were already kind of into it back in the the 90s and early 2000s. And they had a wellness center in Southern California when I was growing up. So being in and around that, I was so lucky to be exposed early on to the ideas of the kind of the Eastern world of prevention is more important than waiting until you get sick and trying to fix things later on, because it's generally a lot more painful that way. And so I would see these people come into their wellness center where they had infrared saunas way before it was cool and infrared heated jade massage breads and were selling various, you know, supplements and superfood type products. And you would see people coming in their 40s, 50s, 60s after things had already gone wrong. So they weren't really doing prevention. They were just taking the more natural way of trying to fix things. And that was great. I saw a lot of people get out of suffering and into a place of much better health, but I saw them just moving the dial from pain to pretty much okay. And it got me thinking, well, what happens if you get ahead of the game here and start doing all this now, starting from okay, how far in the extremely awesome direction could you push the quality of your overall life experience and also your, what's now more commonly being referred to as health span in terms of how long it throughout your life you feel awesome? Do you, do you have the physical robustness of a 45 year old at age 70, maybe, or something along those lines? I didn't know. I didn't have any examples in my life of what this would look like, but I was curious to push the possibilities and see what could be done. And I was getting into making these superfood smoothies for myself and I didn't care what it tasted like. I was results oriented. I wanted what was going to make me feel amazing because I would make this drink with like some hemp protein. And um, I had this mix that had some other Western herbs like milk thistle and uh, chlorella and spirulina in there. And I would just blend it with some um, some frozen fruits and add in some, I started getting into maca because I, I wanted all the stories of what that was supposedly going to do for me. And I didn't care that it tasted like nothing I'd ever had before in a very negative way. <laughs> I just wanted to feel really good. And that was working for me. But eventually at a certain level of something benefiting yourself, the the natural hero's journey of it is to come back from slaying the dragon. And I had kind of slayed my personal dragon in, in terms of making myself feel amazing. You want to share the the findings and learnings with your community. The problem is my community at the time was like late high school, early college years folks who were not health motivated. They were, let's get drunk motivated. Let's be a part of the prescription painkiller epidemic motivated. So I didn't know really what to do about that. And so I just kept it to myself. I would still go party, but I would show up with my herbal elixir with cacao and mucuna prurians and bacopa and ashwagandha in there. Nobody really wanted to even know what was in there and they just kind of, okay, that's Sage. He's doing his thing. But then I went on a surf trip to Costa Rica with some of my best friends in college. And I would go out and surf for four or five, six hours and still have plenty of energy. They were coming into the beach after two hours needing to, to rest and eat and drink, et cetera. And they saw me in the corner of our hostel making these smoothies very quietly, not saying anything about it. And they kind of realized I was up to something different. And they eventually said, hey, can you make me one of those. And I, this is the moment I've been waiting for. And I was excited. The only problem is I had forgotten how bad it tasted because I was totally numb to it at this point. And so uh, I made it for each of them and poured them each a little cup. And they were so toxic from the overall college experience of the you know prescription drugs and the drinking and all of it. Sometimes when you take something that's quite powerfully detoxifying, the toxins are just going to get sent that same way back out of the system <laughs> because that's the fastest route. And so three of the four of them were vomiting within the next five minutes. And so I had to really reconsider my approach to sharing health and wellness with my, my community here. So that's awesome. I realized I had to go to the complete opposite extreme. If I wanted to make a healthy living as accessible as possible to the people I cared about, I had to figure out how to make foods that tasted so good that people would eat and drink them 
just because it was a sensational food experience and just so happened to be maximally healthy in every way possible as an afterthought. I didn't know how I was going to do this, but that was my goal. And then also in Costa Rica, I ended up learning how to make chocolate. And it was kind of mind blowing to me as I was learning more and more about the benefits of cacao as an elite superfood, being the highest natural source of antioxidants, highest natural source of magnesium, chromium, zinc, antioxidants. Uh, you have so much going on in there. And then you get into neurotransmitters that make you feel happy that we all love that chocolate feeling with things like anandamide and serotonin and um, phenethylamine, the love bliss chemical. And so this to me, it was a really unique food because it has a foot in both worlds, the worlds of foods that people definitely consider to be bad for you, but are really delicious, and the worlds of uh, foods that are good for you, but people don't consider to taste so good. And so this is a rare thing because not many foods kind of transcend both worlds like that. And so I thought this could be the ultimate gateway health food, if done right, if you have the cacao source from the optimal place and grown in the optimal way, if you can keep it sugar-free while using only the cleanest and healthiest sugar-free sweeteners that have side benefits rather than side effects. And then my other passion I was developing was learning about traditional herbal systems of indigenous cultures. And these herbs tend to be quite bitter. And in the Western world, we don't have much of a palate for bitter flavors, except the bitter flavor of chocolate. Somehow people have randomly accepted this one bitter flavor, I guess, because it comes in such a you know sensational package apart from that bitter. And so I found that you could camouflage these great herbal ingredients and hide their bitter flavors under the bitter of chocolate and nobody would mind. And so this started out as something I made for myself, for my friends, family, and soon more and more people were requesting it. I ended up in a relationship with a girlfriend who was a total chocolate addict, and I realized I needed to start buying in larger and larger quantities of ingredients to keep her satisfied and keep her around. And then it got to the point, okay, now I have wholesale accounts going for all my ingredients. Maybe it's time to turn this into a business. And by the way, that girlfriend is still with me today and my business partner and, and life partner of 12 years. <laughs> awesome. <clears throat> and here we are. So how, from um, <clears throat> from the moment of the smoothies in Costa Rica to where we are today. How, 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 how many years has that been? So that was around like 18, 19 and now I'm 34. So, um, 16 years. Nice. Yeah. All right. And when you tell people that you're a master chocolatier, I mean, I imagine that that's one of those good conversation starters. It always, oh, you, you know, it's going to be a good conversation starter when the eyes open up a little bit, you know, uh, a lot of jobs and a lot of versions of what I do. I could tell people like, oh, I, you know, I, I run a little business. They go, okay, that's pretty cool. Um, have you ever considered going on a truck tank? Uh, but you say, I make chocolate. They go, really? <laughs> so it's definitely um, a nice blessing and a dream to be kind of living Willy Wonka in the chocolate factory. <laughs> I have to imagine, I just because I, I, I have no idea, it's pro probably really it's it's probably really difficult to accomplish what you've accomplished, which is taking all these wonderful superfoods and 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 healthy things that can improve health span and lifespan that people don't necessarily want to eat, but you've made it delicious. So that in itself is very challenging. But then to scale it and to make a lot of it, that can't have been easy. Definitely. Uh the the production of something as you scale it up is is become definitely brings complexities in terms of how you make it different problems arise nuances in in the production chocolate is so temperamental um it has to go through this very precise series of temperature fluctuations um to solidify it and have it have the right melt point the right creaminess in your mouth it has to just like to a tenth of a degree changing the process will change the final product. Mm -hmm. And so scaling this up as things are, are larger and larger, they tend not to cool down as fast. You run into all kinds of weird production issues like this. And that precision is something that has been, yeah, a huge learning experience to achieve because I didn't go to a you know traditional chef school, traditional chocolate making school. It's just been me figuring it out as I go. But that's it's an opportunity to keep learning, which I think kind of keeps your brain sharp and young. 100%. Yeah. What it made me think of, we're, we've here in, I live in Arizona and it's probably true in every state that we've, we're going through this, this craft beer renaissance or golden era. 
and <clears throat> people love craft beer, but we disparage, I certainly have in the past, large beer makers like a Coors Light or a Bud Light. And I thought about it. I'm like, you know, it's pretty amazing that they can make their beer taste the absolute same and produce this huge quantity of it every day. And so that's what I was thinking. It's probably, it's one thing to create a great chocolate bar, but how do you create huge quantities of it that taste just the, 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 the quality is consistent and, 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 and the same. It's, it's definitely a part of the challenge. And as something is a smaller scale, like you probably encountered in the, in the craft brewery world, it, there are going to be more natural fluctuations, batch to batch, harvest to harvest, the levels that large, large scale food manufacturers go through to kind of smooth all those things together is, is more than a, a little company can do, but you kind of have to educate the customers and, and help them understand, okay, from one season to the next, it might taste slightly different because it's nature. Maybe there was more rain or more cold at this time of year or that time of year in this region or that region. And then we go through also the challenges and adventures of sourcing ingredients from all around the world, from Ecuador to Thailand, to India, to China. And so an example is like right now in Ecuador, there's a massive surge in violence that makes it really challenging to get any shipments out of the country. So that's, of course, um, on a human level, something very sad, but also on a, on a business level, you have to um, really plan ahead and, and be strategic about these things. So um, the, it's a very dynamic experience running a business. So what I'm, I'm, I'm confident that there's lots of challenges to doing what, 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 what you're doing. Um, helping people to to understand that chocolate can be really, really, really good for you when we're conditioned to think that I should never eat chocolate, stuff like that. Absolutely. But it's it's uh, it's one that people are pretty open to receive. I, I'm not trying to talk them into drinking wheatgrass. Mm. It's I think it's a harder sell than talking them into having chocolate. It's it's one of those things where when somebody really is is happy to do something anyways, Telling them it's good for them, they're more ready to hear it. Like um, the average American, if I told them a study came out last week that said that watching TV a minimum of two hours a day is actually good because it brings you stress relief. They're going to say, I knew it. I knew it was good for me all along. I've been doing the right thing. Fortunately, this is actually true in the case of chocolate that it does bring stress relief and um, does have a tremendous list of health benefits. So I don't have to mislead them, but instead I can lure them along this beautiful chocolate path where nothing but goodness awaits. So nothing but goodness awaits. It's a win-win. It's all these positive things. What, what has been pushback if, if, if any. Um, using the highest quality ingredients, of course, comes with a cost. And so we'll never be price competitive with a Hershey's bar that is grown in low quality soil in Africa, procured using questionable sources of labor, grown in uh, contaminated heavy metal toxic laden soil and combined with really cheap conventional GMO sugar. We're trying to take the absolute highest quality jungle grown, wild grown cacao, combine it with the highest quality herbal extracts in the world, keep it sugar free. So it's something that for some people is going to be a rare treat, but I still encourage people, look, if you just have it once every now and then, and this kind of acts as a a way that when you would have otherwise turned to an unhealthier treat, you can have this there as your backup in those moments. Great. If this is something where you have the financial abundance to enjoy on a daily basis, also great. And the other part is being sugar-free. A lot of people have experienced that sugar-free products can use unhealthy sweeteners. There's a, a myriad of those out there in the mainstream food world. So they're a little hesitant to believe that sugar-free can be healthy sometimes. And also a lot of sugar-free sweeteners that are maybe healthy have weird flavors and aftertaste to them that we've managed to avoid, but sometimes it takes some convincing of the customer that that they're really going to enjoy this. And so we've always had like a 100% satisfaction guarantee that usually helps us to get around most of that because we take away the risk. Yeah, it's a good point. If you're not happy, we will give you your money back. Is it that right. simple? It's that simple, exactly. And and we've had a remarkably small number of people over the past 10 years have any issues. I love it. Are your folks, your, 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 your parents still alive? They are, yeah. And are they still doing the health food wellness, the wellness yeah, so center? They, they transitioned from their wellness center to, to um, running, they basically have the largest U.S. dealer of 
um, clear light saunas is their business. So they're in the infrared sauna business now. And I kind of moonlight working in their business as well. Um, it's, it's a really cool blessing to also be able to take some time and work with my parents and have, you know, most people only talk with their parents every now and then they don't see them that often. Um, I've always kind of wanted to maximize my time with them. It's something I've kind of had an awareness of since I was young that they're not going to be around forever. I really want to make every moment count. And so I get still getting to work with them is, is really special. Yeah, for sure. And it's uh, certainly I, that sort of what, what I was trying to get at was the entrepreneurship piece of this, because it's one thing to be passionate about helping others and serving your loved ones in your community, but then quite another to make something commercially successful. So, yeah, I also was fortunate in the sense that on, on my mom's side of the family, almost everybody of their, her, her six brothers and sisters, um, or I guess she's one of six of so five brothers and sisters, they're all entrepreneurial by nature. So I had a lot of examples of that growing up, which I think is a huge impact. If somebody grows up and everyone in the family are just, you know, career people working in the machine of a large corporation, you kind of have a different picture of the world and how adulthood and making money and, and the whole financial adventure works. I am. Yeah. Who knows, maybe my life would have been easier if I had that and <laughs> not as stressful sometimes. But at the same time, I get the great adventure of entrepreneurship. Yeah, which 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 it certainly is. And you use the hero's journey um as as we're getting started, because that's one hundred percent what it is. And you have to have a a driving force that's animating you to go through the tough times and obviously the fun times are easy for everybody to go through. Um can you pinpoint a moment or a certain time where you're like, oh my gosh, is this worth doing? There's so many, but <laughs> I, you know, I would say, um, like the COVID times were, were challenging for us. There was, of course, the initial run up when everybody was stockpiling and our sales were skyrocketing. I was like, wow, this is you know, chaos happening in the world, but it looks like we're going to survive it okay because people are really enjoying chocolate while they're in lockdown. But then we ran into the problem that most of our, the, you know, the, the the stocking up kind of sales really slowed down, and it got to a point where nobody was shopping that much in retail anymore because everybody was just ordering everything online. And for us, going into the pandemic, ninety percent of our business was through retailers. We weren't in in big big stores, you know, none of the kind of big box type stores, but through kind of more mom and pop health food stores across the country and doctors' offices and. Um, gift shops and things of that nature. And when people shifted to buying online, even if these stores were offering then online platforms, you didn't get that moment at checkout at the counter where you see that chocolate and you grab it as that last moment buy and to give yourself a little healthy treat. So that side of our business just cratered. And so we had to, of course, start a transition to really building ourselves into a more of an e-commerce online first business. And we made the transition, but the runway was just barely long enough. We had at one point in the like late summer, early fall of 2020 had to take on a bit of a loan that we were then able to pay back to cross that bridge or extend our runway, so to speak. And so that that was a scary time for us in, in the sense that there was like some nights where you just lay awake, like, should we just wrap this up and I, you know, move on and just do something else and this just hasn't worked we tried but we've fortunately pushed through and been able to continue building and and now for a small business like us being online first is actually a, a much more sustainable way to do business because you have that direct relationship with the customer which is also so much more satisfying and it's mild wordplay but i bet i bet your product's pretty sticky once people have it uh, they probably <laughs> become customers for a long time yeah, it's physically, it's slippery, you know, cacao butter, it's like, a, it creates a lubrication on your fingers there. But um, it's definitely when, when, when people have it, and they come to this realization of I can have the dream chocolate experience that I thought I never could, if I wanted to be healthy, I thought this was going to be outside the bounds of what I could do on my health journey. Yet here, this is that's actually incorporating these herbs to, to support me with whatever my health goal is. It's a beautiful thing. And, and something that I'm so grateful to be able to share with people. Yeah. Is it actually true that you can eat this every day? It is. It is. Absolutely. And now portion will vary from person to person based on various factors, especially different people have different genetics in terms of how they are going to process different foods. We have 
this bio-individuality. For some people, uh, they do a very small amount of chocolate and they have a, a tremendous reaction to it. They'll have half of one piece, a little square of chocolate, and th they're over the moon. Most people on average will have something like half a bar of our chocolate, and that's kind of the sweet spot. And that's what we put as the serving sizes recommendation on there. Some people have a whole bar, and that's okay too, because one of the big motivating factors for me in wanting to make sugar-free chocolate originally is that even with some of the other healthy chocolates out there that were using higher quality ingredients, they were still using some form of sugar, whether it was a coconut palm sugar or maple sugar or something else. And with these, it's not a bad, bad problem if you're just having a small amount, but it's pretty quick that you get to a point where it's like, okay, this is too much sugar. I got to back off here. Otherwise I'm going overboard. And so I wanted to remove that ceiling so people could enjoy a little bit more chocolate. God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I can tell you that Sage was kind enough to, to send some of the delicious chocolate to my house and, and I love it and my wife loves it. And I don't think we're going to give any to our kids just because we love it so much, but, uh, that I can I'm certainly so glad you guys enjoyed it. Yeah, I could certainly say that 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 it is awesome. So, so that Sage, thank you for that. Thank you so much for coming on. Where can people learn more about you, and how can they get their own chocolate from Addictive Wellness? If you enjoyed this whole area of conversation, and you want to hear me talk more about my like over the top passion for health and wellness and and nutrition and herbs and adaptogens and supplements. Um, we have a YouTube channel. Um, you can search addictive wellness on YouTube and we're posting there a couple of times a week. And if you're interested in trying our chocolates or adaptogens and other products, um, check out our website, addictivewellness.com and um, would love to stay connected with everybody. Excellent. Well, if you enjoyed this much as I did, so Sage, Show Sage your appreciation. Share today's show with a friend who also appreciates good ideas. Go to addictivewellness.com. Check out everything we've been talking about. Check out the YouTube channel, Addictive Wellness. And I'll certainly link all of those in the notes. Thanks again, Sage. Thank you. Until next time, remember, do your part by doing your best. <laughs>